We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm going to be talking about malignant malaria in humans. So uh, malaria is one of the world's leading infectious diseases. Uh, in 2018, there were 228 million cases and about a half a million deaths. Um, so this is actually compared, if you can, if you can compare that to, to the number of COVID-19 cases, um, there's actually quite a bit more, still quite a bit more malaria than there is COVID-19, uh, even though malaria is limited to uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Human malaria is caused by at least five species of eukaryotic um, apicomplex and parasites, and Plasmodium falciparum malaria is, is the most lethal and what I'll be talking about most this afternoon. Malaria is spread by female anopheline mosquitoes, uh, and the parasites have a very, very life, uh, complex life cycle, um, which I'll briefly uh, describe. So uh, malaria starts by the, when, when you're bitten by a mosquito, which releases hundreds of sporozoites into your bloodstream. Uh, these sporozoites will migrate to your liver and set up a brief in, uh, asymptomatic infection that will last up to 10 days. The symptoms of malaria only start when the parasites exit your liver and begin to replicate in your erythrocytes. Uh, a parasite will invade an erythrocyte, um, it will consume the hemoglobin in your erythrocyte, it will replicate, and then when it's done, it will burst the er erythrocyte and, and releasing about 20 new merozoites, which will then reinvade erythrocytes. This is where you get all the symptoms of malaria, the characteristic fever and chills. In response to cues that we don't entirely understand, some of the uh, parasites will decide that it's time to exit and they will differentiate into male and female gametocytes. And these are the only forms of the parasite that can survive in the midgut of a mosquito. When a mosquito takes a blood meal, the gametocytes will immediately differentiate into male and female gametes. They will mate with one another. Uh, there will be a brief meiosis. The, uh, Resulting parasites will migrate um, out of the midgut of the mosquito, uh, set up an oocyst on the midgut wall, and then eventually uh, uh, they will uh, migrate to the salivary glands where they can start the infection again. Malaria, when you get it, can be very, very nasty. You can have uh, the, the most typical symptoms are a cyclical fever and anemia, uh, but you can also get end organ damage, especially with Plasmodium falciparum. Uh, much of the pathology is associated with a cytokine storm that comes from the high parasite burden in the blood stages. And if you aren't treated, um, and, is, and if you haven't been exposed to malaria before, um, uh, malaria can often be fatal. Death is often from respiratory distress, uh, similar to what you get with COVID-19, and it's caused by brain swelling and pressure on the brain stem. And the reason that you have brain swelling with malaria is because the parasites um, alter the surface of an infected erythrocyte uh, to help with their survival. So um, in addition to, to modifying the erythrocyte so they can eat the hemoglobin in it, they will also send out projections that make the erythrocyte sticky. And these sticky erythrocytes will, will cytoadhere to the capillaries uh, primarily in your brain, and this allows them to avoid clearance in your spleen. 
The problem with this is that uh, it, it ultimately can uh, um, uh, produce neurological uh, symptoms and brain swelling, which ultimately can lead to death. So um, critical to the pathogenesis of malaria is, is, is the process of antigenic variation. So uh, when we think of viral pathogens, um, often you get them once and then you become immune. And with malaria, and this is the reason we have so many cases, people get infected over and over again. So in some parts of Africa, um, it's very typical that you would have uh, malaria multiple times every year. And this might last you might have symptomatic malaria up until you know you're in your 20s. So you can get infected over and over again. Now what happens is that the parasites uh, in a different in a given geographical area will display a different set of epitopes on the surface of, of the infected cells. And then the parasites uh, can use recombination as well as um, silencing of specific gene families to, to change the set of, of antigens that are displayed. So you can uh, generate antibodies to one type of parasite, and then the parasite will decide to switch and make a new form, which will be a minor population, and you'll no longer have antibodies to this. So if you look at um, the, the, the sort of cycle that goes on, you can see waves of parasitemia coming up and then going away again. Another problem is, is that you can become somewhat immune um, through repeated exposure to malaria, and then you can get up and leave for example, came, come to the United States where we don't really have much malaria and then after, uh, go back after 10 years and you can get uh, really sick again. Um, so many of the cases that we see in the United States uh, come from people that, that were exposed to malaria as a child, thought they could handle it, went back to their home country and then discovered that they could no longer handle it. The AT richness of the genome um, actually encourages a lot of, of, of recombination, which is essential to the pathogenesis of the parasite. Um, well, it sounds very uh, dire. Um, malaria can be actually fairly easily treated if you have, um, have drugs. And we have several different drugs that, that work fairly well against malaria parasites. Um, most of them are derived from natural products um, such as artemisinin and quinine. Um, you've probably heard of, of, of taking gin and tonics to, to treat malaria symptoms. And while we have resistance, uh, if you're treated in time, uh, it's most likely you will not uh, probably, you will not die from malaria. Now, an interesting feature about malaria parasites is, is, is that, um, that they can infect many different species. So there's over 170 different plasmodium species, and some of them affect uh, penguins, some of them affect ducks, uh, like coronaviruses. They can also be found in bats and in mice, and there's a gecko, and, and also in gorillas and chimpanzees. Um, and there might be even more plasmodium species than, uh, than uh, documented. It's probable that we just haven't looked hard enough. Now, um, zoonoses, uh, when we jump from one species to the next, tend to be rare with plasmodium. And this is because um, malaria parasites tend to uh, employ specialized and species-specific molecular machineries uh, in order to, that they use to invade red cells. So uh, this is a diagram of the red cell shown in the left, and the little uh, purple thing is, an, is a malaria parasite. And and what they do is they, they, they use specific receptors to dock onto the erythrocyte. And then they, um, they basically squeeze a load of proteins into the erythrocyte membrane, which causes it to deform. And the membrane will deform and then eventually enclose the malaria parasite around itself. And so since different vertebrates have different sets of proteins, and this is a very specific process, a given parasite will typically only infect closely related species. So for example, um, Plasmodium burgii, which is a rodent malaria, will just infect rodents, um, typically just rat and mice. And human malaria, falciparum malaria, can infect chimpanzees, but it really uh, doesn't infect um, other types of monkeys all that well. Um, there's a lot of different receptors that are expressed in the parasite, and they have different ligands. Uh, on the red cells and, and you need to change both in order to get in a, a successful infection. And these are just some of the um, receptors and ligands that have been studied so far for some different species. 
So the annual death rate um, from malaria in many African countries is, is actually similar to the death rate from COVID-19 in, in New York. Uh, but the big difference um, is that uh, the death rate in malaria parasites typically happening in pre-reproductive age children. Um, so you can imagine that this has a very big impact on, on the human genome. Um, it's estimated that before modern anti-malarial drugs, more than 20% of the children uh, would have died uh, in their first decade of life uh, from malaria. Um, typically, they would have uh, been exposed to over 700 infectious mosquito bites each year. So um, you can imagine, again, that this would have a big impact on, on the human genome. So with repeated infections and high mortality, selective pressure on the human genome is intense. Um, and there are several different alleles that we know uh, have a major contribution. And one of these is, is the sickle cell allele, or hemoglobin S. So if you have uh, both copies of the sickle cell allele, it's very disadvantageous and you're very sick. If you happen to be a heterozygous uh, for the sickle cell allele, it provides uh, protection from severe malaria and is clearly uh, maintained in African populations because of the protective advantage uh, that, it, um, that it confers. The sickle cell allele is found at high levels in areas where malaria is prevalent. Uh, the exact mechanism by which sickle cell, the sickle, human sickle cell allele provides protection is not that well understood. In addition, there's a variety of other different uh, blood group alleles that uh, are, are alleles of genes, of proteins that are expressed in red cells that are thought to confer protection against malaria. One of them is the Duffy blood group antigen, uh, which has been uh, lost in many Africans, and this provides protection against uh, Plasmodium vivax, which uh, does not infect uh, many African populations. Um, there's also a variety of thassalemias that are found in Mediterranean populations. And it's even thought that the human uh, ABO blood group um, w arose uh, many millions of years ago uh, to provide protection against malaria. Uh, people with the O uh, blood group type uh, tend to uh, get less severe malaria. So um, I'm going to talk recently about one story, and, and there are many stories about the impact of malaria on the human genome and evolution. Uh, one I wanted to just briefly mention is cytidine monophosphate and acetyl neuraminic acid hydrolase, or CMAH. Um, and I want to talk about this one because there might be some other speakers that will be talking about it uh, today. So this encodes the most common form of sialic acid on mammalian cells, or the most common form of sialic acid on mammalian cells are N-acetylneuramic acid and N-glycolylneuramic acid, or NU5GC. So humans express NU5AC but lack NU5GC because of an ALU-mediated exon deletion in the gene encoding cytidine um, monophosphate NU5-AC hydrolase. Which, uh, which performs the conversion. And um, this is found only in humans, uh, and it's not found in some of our nearest um, neighbors, such as, as chimpanzees and gorillas. And expression of CMAH in non-human cells, uh, such as CHO cells, can result in glycosyl glycosylation patterns that, that can trigger immune reactions. In order to, to investigate whether CMAH provides protection against malaria, um, colleagues of mine at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, wanted to test whether they could express CMAH uh, from macaques and make human erythrocytes more susceptible to malaria. So uh, they used a type of malaria parasite here that primarily infects uh, macaques. It's found in Southeast Asia. And it causes a fair amount of disease in, in, in the monkeys. And if, um, if you get bitten by a mosquito that carries Plasmodium nolzii malaria, you can come down with fever and malaria-like symptoms, except the parasite won't replicate uh, for any period of time in your erythrocytes. So if you want to maintain Plasmodium nolzii in, in a culture in the laboratory, you basically have to get macaque blood and you have to get Plasmodium nolzii. And you need the two together in order to get a replication cycle going and, and to get the parasites to, 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 to reproduce themselves. So what Manoj and colleagues wanted to test was to see if, um, if, if you switched out uh, the uh, human CMAH uh, with the uh, uh, version from macaques, if you could now get uh, uh, the monkey parasite to replicate in human erythrocytes. So uh, to do this, they took uh, human uh, erythrocyte stem cells, uh, they, they added in the macaque CMAH, 
And then they were able to show that these modified human erythrocytes expressed the protein, uh, sialylated proteins, uh, typical, similar to what you would see on the surface of, of the macaque erythrocyte. And uh, that is shown right here. And even though they didn't do a complete gene replacement, you can see uh, in, the, in panel F that uh, many of the glycoproteins are now sialylated. So then after establishing this model, they wanted to see if you would have increased ability for parasites um, of Plasmodium uh, nolzi species, if they would be able to uh, replicate in human erythrocytes. And in fact, um, if you express C, uh, CMAH from Plasmodium nolzi on human erythrocytes, uh, you do get much better replication um, in, in human erythrocytes. So this uh, provides circumstantial evidence that um, potentially the loss of CMAH at one point in human evolutionary history um, allowed uh, para uh, humans to potentially avoid infection uh, by uh, parasites similar to the monkey parasites that currently infect macaques. This is just one story, however, and there's just a, a sort of a, a, an endless um, list of different hemoglobinopathies that, that may pro provide protection against malaria. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a study that was published in, in Science. The authors showed that there's a Dantu blood type um, that, 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 that's strongly associated with, with protection against malaria. And, and the thing about this is that there's often a lot of switching that goes on. Um, so you have the Dantu uh, blood group present in parts of Africa, and then it, it's most likely that you have specific parasites in this part of Africa that can invade um, erythrocytes with this particular, this particular blood group. And we also know that, that, if you, that many of these uh, receptors are actually non-essential and you can knock one out and then another one will pop up. Um, so it, keeps, it seems that they keep a lot of receptors um, in reserve, uh, and it's essentially an evolutionary arms race where the parasites often changing, the humans often changing, and, and they're both trying to outdo each other over and over again. One of the questions that I have after, that one might have after doing this is, you know, it, it seems to be fairly easy to, to acquire mutations that allow you to escape malaria. And yet malaria continues to have a very big impact on, 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 on human health. Um, again, still huge numbers of cases. And, you know, since it's so difficult to maintain a life cycle, you need to have mosquitoes, you need to have the right receptors, uh, you need to have tropical weather. I mean, how does this persist? And, you know, is there any advantage that, that comes to the human species from having malaria infection? Um, and I actually was scouring the literature and I couldn't really find anything. Um, but if there's no advantage, why, why does it keep, why does it persist? Do parasites possibly drive speciation? Does pressure on blood groups have an evolutionary advantage over, for other diseases? Are infected people possibly fitter in some ways or more attractive in some ways than uninfected ones? I'm not sure we know about that. The other thing that I wanted to bring up, and just to end my talk, is is uh, the uh, the lamp, the lamp, um, the street light effect. And this is an old joke. And uh, there's a policeman, and there's a, a drunk, and he's uh, he's fumbling around under this the, the the street light, and the policeman asks him what he's doing, and the uh, the drunk says, "Oh, I'm looking for my keys." And so they they both look for a few minutes, and, and they can't find anything. And, and the policeman says, "Are you sure?" Uh, you lost your keys here. And he says, no, I left them in the park, except this is the only place I could see to look. And it's important to remember when we study malaria parasites that we often only work with a fairly small number of, of isolates. And it's very difficult to take isolates that you collect out of people into culture, uh, possibly because you need to have the right match between erythrocytes and parasites. And, and the studies that we perform on the one or two different uh, common laboratory strains uh, may not necessarily tell us what is really happening out there in the big wide world. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm Susan Strester. I am a faculty at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Today, I am going to talk about these mosquito-borne viral infections called dengue and Zika. My lab focuses on the understand the immunology of these virus infections using mouse models, um, tissue culture, human tissue culture models, and patient samples from endemic countries such as Nepal. Shown here is the outline of my talk. I will briefly introduce these viruses. 
Then I will address three interrelated questions. Specifically, first, I'll talk about why, despite 70 years of um, research, we don't have treatment and an effective vaccine against dengue. Then I'll talk about how prior exposure to dengue, so the pre-existing dengue immunity, influence subsequent infection with Zika infection, and then how this prior exposure to dengue also impacts Zika evolution. Let's start with the introduction to these viruses. Dengue and Zika, these are very similar viruses. Both of these viruses are transmitted by these mosquitoes called Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. These two different species of mosquitoes, they're actually found right here in California, in fact, right here in San Diego. And shown here in the middle is the transmission cycle involving these mosquitoes and us, the humans. These viruses, they belong to the genus Flavivirus. This genus represents a, a number of important human um, pathogens that includes West Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, and yellow fever. This genus belongs to the family Flaviviridae. The well-known family member is hepatitis C virus. These are small envelope RNA viruses. The genome is only about 10.7 uh, KB in a single-stranded and positive polarity. What that means is the genome is also the messes. Shown here is the schematic for the genomic structure of these viruses. The squiggly lines at the ends, these are the five prime and the three prime untranslated reasons. And these different valid proteins, C, M, E, and NS1 through five, these represent different viral proteins. NS5 here, this is the biggest viral protein, and this is also the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of these viruses. This is the reason why RNA viruses have such high um, rates of mutation because this enzyme, this polymerase, is very error prone. What kind of diseases do these viruses cause? Dengue and Zika, both of them cause a spectrum of illnesses ranging from mild to severe. The mild form of dengue infection is called dengue fever and is characterized by high fever, rash, headache, joint, and muscle pain. The next severe form of the infection is called dengue hemorrhagic fever. Um, this is kind of a misnomer. The hemorrhagic manifestations, they're typically just eye, nose, and gum bleeding. And the hallmark of dengue hemorrhagic fever is this phenomenon called plasma leakage, where you have leakage of fluid from blood vessels into tissues. And if this plasma leakage syndrome becomes severe enough, then people undergo shock. And this dengue shock syndrome can be fatal. Similarly, Zika fever, the mild form of Zika infection is called Zika fever, and Dengue fever and Zika fever are actually virtually indistinguishable um, in terms of clinical symptoms. Zika complications include microcephaly, which is um, small head, babies with small head. And microcephaly is just one of several features associated with Zika-related birth defects. The whole constellation of um, Zika-associated birth defects which can include both vision and hearing defects is now called congenital Zika syndrome. And in adults, Zika can also cause this syndrome called Guillain-Barre, where you have this temporary onset of paralysis. And in fact, it can be severe enough that people need um, a ventilator. Shown here is the geographic distribution of these viruses worldwide. In the green is dengue, and in the red bottom here is uh, Zika. You can readily see that some of the same countries, actually many of the same countries, have both dengue and Zika. And as I told you before, both of these viruses are transmitted by mosquitoes, but unlike dengue, which can be transmitted only by mosquitoes, Zika can be transmitted vertically from mother to child and also sexually. In terms of these two viruses being the major problems for the world, um, an estimated 390 million infections occur each year, and out of those, about 24,000 die for dengue. As for Zika, during this famous 2015-16 Zika epidemic in the Americas, um, more than 40,000 Zika infections were recorded in the U.S. and U.S. territories. And in Brazil, the epicenter of the epidemic, um, Brazil had over 200,000 of Zika infections and almost 9,000 Zika-related birth defects. 
So why are these viruses? I've told you dengue has been, uh, people have been trying to do dengue research for over 70 years. Why are these viruses are emerging and re-emerging? And the answer to that question is really us. Um, massive urbanization. People are moving from villages to cities. And our habits, which includes the use of these non-biodegradable containers, which are, of course, great habitats for these uh, virus-transmitting mosquitoes. And of course, in many countries, there's this massive breakdown of programs that are involved in, that are required for vector control and also this general public health program infrastructure. And in this day and age, we, um, we can be here in San Diego and in less than 24 hours, we can be in completely different parts of the world, thanks uh, to this global movement. So it's not a surprise. Now, in 2019, 2020, we're hearing countries like Nepal, which people typically think of as this Himalayan country, now has to deal with dengue. So now I would like to focus on the big question surrounding infections with these viruses, it's specifically dengue. Why, do we have tr why don't we have treatment and an effective vaccine against dengue? The answer to that question lies in the fact that these viruses exist as four viruses. For dengue, we call them as dengue serotypes one, two, three, four. So what this means is that a person does not develop a lifelong immunity to infection with dengue. In fact, you can be reinfected second, third, and perhaps fourth time. And in numerous epidemiologic studies have shown that the single greatest risk factor for coming down with severe dengue disease is secondary dengue infection. This is in the case of older children and adults. And in the case of infants, it's being born to dengue immune mothers. So what's so common about these two groups of patients that um, allows this, this prior exposure to dengue being the single greatest risk factor? So before I give you the answer, I have to give you a little bit of background on the adaptive immune response to viral infections in general. You have these viruses, dengue. Um, they infect people, and the two major arms of the immune system come into play. The first one is called B cells. These are the cells that make antibodies. Antibodies are the ones they recognize and they destroy these viruses, and we call them they neutralize those viruses. In contrast, T cells, these cells recognize virally infected cells and directly kill them. And in terms of the vaccines that are approved for human use, most of the vaccine design is based on this principle here where the vaccine-induced antibody responses are directly destroying these pathogens, viruses, or bacteria. So now, to go back to our central question, why are these people with secondary dengue infections and these infants who are born to dengue immune mothers, they're coming down with severe disease. And the answer has to do with the fact that both groups of individuals, they have these antibodies. These antibodies are coming from first infection in these people with secondary infection. In the case of these infants, these antibodies are coming from their mother. These are maternal dengue antibodies. Based on these epidemiologic observations, this hypothesis called antibody-dependent enhancement, or ADE for short, was formulated. According to this hypothesis, dengue, this is the virus here, binds with the antibodies. Instead of the antibodies being neutralizing and getting rid of these virus infections, these antibodies are subneutralizing. So what that means is that now the virus antibody immune complex, it, they are able to enter these cells. Normally, these cells would not have been able to be infected with this virus. Now, through this antibody pathway, they're able to enter the cells, replicate, and these high levels of viral infection then triggers all these hallmarks of severe dengue. This hypothesis called ADE, it was proposed almost half a century ago. And it was only back in 2010 that our laboratory provided evidence in support of this hypothesis. Before I tell you how we did that, let me um, explain how this hypothesis fits in the context of human infection. During primary infection with dengue, 
you, by definition, you don't have secondary infection, people develop a nice antibody response and most people develop actually no disease or it's a smile disease. In the case of secondary infection with the same serotype, so this is homologous, same serotype, the antibody response developed during the first infection they will be able to recognize and neutralize, get rid of this virus infection. So the person is not protected and has no disease. Now, during secondary infection with a different serotype, so this heterologous, so I have a different color virus here, the antibody response to the first infection, not all of those antibodies will be able to recognize the second serotype. And this leads to this sub-neutralizing antibody condition and that leads to this ADE-mediated enhancement of disease severity. And in the case of infants, these maternal antibodies, it doesn't matter now if the baby is infected for the first time, second, third, or fourth time, these maternal antibodies are sub-neutralizing, so that means they're not good enough to neutralize, get rid of the virus infection. This sub-neutralizing antibodies again mediate ADE and results in severe dengue in these infants born to dengue immune mothers. So back in 2010, we provided support for this hypothesis by developing a mouse model. We performed a rather simple experiment where we took a mouse, injected this mouse with um, antibodies against dengue or this immune serum from previously infected people or animals, then challenged this mouse with dengue. Exactly as predicted by the AD hypothesis, as the infection progresses, we see high levels of viral infection, we see this phenomena where you have all kinds of immune molecules are upregulated in this phenomenon called cytokine storm. We have vascular leakage and ultimately the mouse dies. What this work showed is this phenomenon of antibody dependent uh, enhancement converts a mild disease into this lethal disease. In this mouse model, mild disease is if the mouse was not infected with, um, was infected only with the virus and not antibody, this mouse would survive, it would get a mild disease. And you can imagine as most of the vaccines that are currently approved for human use involved around inducing antibody responses, it's this, this phenomenon, this process called ADE can be a problem for uh, designing dengue vaccines based on traditional vaccine uh, approach. Now, since 2016, um, the emerge, since the emergence of uh, uh, Zika in the Americas in 2016, in these countries where you, that are endemic for dengue, um, we've been forced to ask many other important questions related to how the immune response to one virus in, impacts the um, infection with the other. So one of the first questions that we've been addressing in my lab is how does prior exposure to dengue impact subsequent infection with Zika and vice versa? And again, this is an important question in the field because these viruses co-circulate, these dengue transmitting mosquitoes are are in the same country, same geographic locations, and the immune response, both the antibody and T cell response to these viruses are highly cross-reactive, meaning the immune response to dengue can recognize um, Zika and vice versa. Again, we used our favorite model, these are mouse models, and we did this type of experiment where we took a pregnant mouse infected with Zika, and as expected, Zika uh, replicates high at high levels in these pregnant animals and both the mother and the um, babies die. In contrast, if we infect the females with dengue and then challenge with Zika, we see that this mother has very little Zika virus, it survives the Zika infection, and the babies are also born healthy. This kind of experiment showed that this prior dengue exposure, this pre-existing dengue immunity actually provides cross protection against subsequent Zika infection. We reported our results back in 2017 and 2018. And last year in 2019, uh, three different groups uh, representing three independent human cohorts indeed observed the same uh, phenomena, which is this prior dengue exposure provides cross protection against subsequent Zika infection, even against congenital Zika syndrome. 
the human data allowed us to uh, give us more confidence in our mouse model of this sequential uh, dengue Zika infection. And we next asked this following question, how does prior exposure to dengue influence Zika evolution? Again, if I uh, going back at the beginning of my talk, these are RNA viruses because of the RNA polymerase that is highly error prone, these viruses have high um, uh, mutation rate. So on the left is this natural transmission cycle between the mosquitoes and humans. What we decided to do was model, mimic this natural transmission cycle by replacing the human host with a mouse. And instead of using these mosquitoes, we decided to use mosquito cells. We took a human isolate, and so this is a Zika strain isolated from humans, injected into the mouse, and the virus coming out of the mouse was injected back into these mosquito cells, and the virus that was grown in these mosquito cells was injected again back into a new set of mice. So we, we repeated this cycle 10 times, and we used two different types of animals. The first one is a naive animal, so they've never seen any kind of a virus before, dengue, dengue viruses before. And the second kind of mouse is a dengue immune mouse. So it's been previously exposed to dengue and has cleared the infection. And now we're um, conducting this passaging um, experiment. We isolated these two different, what we call mouse adapted um, uh, Zika strains, this Zika naive P10, it was passes only in these non-immune naive animals, and Zika dengue immune P10 means um, this is the virus that we isolated from these after passing uh, alternately between these mosquito cells and these dengue immune animals. When we sequenced these viruses, we found the two mutations in this Zika naive P10 virus, these exact same two mutations were also present in this dengue immune, uh, Zika dengue immune P10 virus, plus this, this virus strain also had an additional mutation in the viral genome. In the next slide, I'll show you what these viruses do. When we infect a naive animal, this is the non-immune, they've never seen dengue before, um, we see that 100% of the mice that were mock infected just with the virus diluent, they survive as expected. In contrast, if the mice were infected with um, Zika, the parental isolate, or these two mouse adapted mouse passes strains, 100% of them die, and there's really no difference between these three different viral strains. So this is as expected. Now, when we look, when we perform the same experiments, but instead of naive mouse, now these are dengue immune mouse, we see that the parental virus, if these mice were infected with the parental virus, 100% of them survive, meaning these, this prior exposure to dengue provided this cross protection against Zika, just as expected. However, when we infected these animals now with our two mouse adopted out viruses, 100% of these animals die. And this virus, the green line here, this is the, these are the mice that were infected with the virus that was passes in dengue immune animals, and they die even faster than the animals that were infected with the virus that was passes only in the naive animals. So what this result showed is that the Zika viruses, they can evolve to become so virulent that the pre-existing dengue immunity can no longer confer, confer this cross protection. And our experiment with um, Zika passes viruses in the dengue immune animals showed that Zika can actually evolve to evade this pre-existing dengue immunity. So with this type of work, our, what, we've, what we're beginning to realize is that with these diseases, this dengue and Zika, these are quintessential emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. They have complicated relationships with the humans, there's mosquito vectors and the virus. I'd like to thank the members of my laboratory who, who performed the experiments. The main people who performed are and, uh, Jose Angel, Annie, and Zinseng. Um, our collaborators include, include Michael Diamond at Washington University, Ralph Barrick at UNC Chapel Hill, and we'd like to thank um, the NIH and on the UCSD Chiva Center for Mucosal Immunology um, and LGI Institutional Support uh, for funding. Thank you for your attention.
Hi everybody, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation today. So today I'm going to give you an overview about uh, salmonella in uh, humans and other animals. So uh, the pathogen salmonella um, are gram-negative bacteria. As you can see here, those are these gram-negative roses. Uh, 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 the bacterium is motile due to Spiritricus flagella. It colonizes the gut of animals and there are two species, uh, Salmonella enterica and Salmonella bongrae. So you can see here that Salmonella enterica has uh, six subspecies and there is only uh, Salmonella bongorai and this Salmonella they uh, primarily colonize uh, um, cold uh, blooded animals like reptiles. Subspecies enterica one however is where there are um, uh, all the uh, salmonella strains that you find in uh, humans. Um, they can infect humans as well as other mammals. And these include uh, salmonella um, enteritidis and typhi murium, as well as uh, salmonella typhi and paratyphi that are really specific uh, to humans. Uh, so um, non-typhoidal salmonella uh, is one of the primarily uh, class the primary classification of salmonella. So we have uh, non-typhoidal and typhoidal salmonella. And uh, non-typhoidal salmonella, um, uh, there is over 2,000 serovars, but the most prevalent one are salmonella typhimurium and salmonella enteritidis. Uh, in a given year, we have at least 100 million cases worldwide, and antimicrobial resistance is a, an emerging issue. And in the US, we have about 1.35 million cases, 26,000 hospitalization and 420 deaths and at least 400 million in medical cost. So this infection uh, is a zoonosis, which means it can transmit it from animal to humans and is a foodborne infection. And in fact, it's primarily transmitted from food sources, although it can also be transmitted, for example, by uh, pet animals. The typhoidal salmonella um, is actually a smaller group of salmonella, and, and these include the salmonella typhi and salmonella paratyphi A, B, and C. And uh, um, this is a big problem worldwide. There is uh, an, up to 27 million cases worldwide and 135,000 deaths. But as you can see, the infection is primarily localized in the Indian subcontinent as well as in Africa. And in the US, most cases are due to travel. They're imported from these areas. There are about 5,700 infections and 620 hospitalizations. And in contrast to the non-typhoidal salmonella, there is no animal reservoir. Uh, so there is uh, um, only uh, humans are infected and and uh, and, uh, and can transmit. So the transmission is primarily is exclusively human to human. And uh, some patients uh, can become a symptomatic carrier. Like for example, this is the case uh, of a typhoid of typhoid Mary, which uh, she was she was a famous. Uh, a cook who uh, transmitted salmonella typhi to many people and uh, um, salmonella typhi in this carrier it's, uh, colonizes the whole blood. So what are the manifestations of disease in humans? Um, Non-typhoidal salmonella, they cause primarily inflammatory diarrhea. This is a, a disease characterized by fever and white blood cells in the stool samples. These are neutrophils. But in 5% of patients, children, elderly, immunocompromised, salmonella can actually cause uh, bacteremia. In typhoid fever is a different disease and actually uh, it manifests primarily with fever. In fact, in endemic area, it's often difficult to distinguish typhoid fever from other diseases um, like malaria or brucellosis, also, um, which also are characterized by fever. Uh, in the 30% of cases, uh, patients get diarrhea, but the diarrhea is different from the inflammatory diarrhea caused from non-typhoidal salmonella, and is primarily characterized by mononuclear infiltrate. So uh, what I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to cover some topics about the differences between the different salmonella disease uh, in, uh, in humans, and uh, I'm going to go over these topics uh, in, in a little bit, and what we know and what we don't know. So first, let me introduce you to salmonella in uh, animal models and the animal models that we can use to, uh, to study inflammatory diarrhea uh, as well as typhoid fever. So inflammatory diarrhea is caused by uh, salmonella, typhimurium and other serovars that are broad host range. 
And uh, so th- and that's why there could be a broad use of animal models that includes calf, rhesus macaques. And these are developed a disease that is fairly similar to humans with diarrhea and neutrophil infiltrate. And macaques has also been used in co-infection studies, like for example, with HIV and in malaria model. And uh, the mouse model that is used is the streptomycin treated mouse model, which does not develop diarrhea, develops some loose stools. Uh, with neutrophil infiltrate and can also be used for co-infection study. And typhoid fever, and on the other hand, as I said, is only infectious in humans. So humans have been used, actually, human volunteers to study, to study typhoid fever. Um, and more recently, also humanized mouse models um, with the hum- humanized with human cell, stem cells, and these mouse develop lethality and can be used to study the natural pathogens, but definitely one of the most used models uh, is the mouse typhoid model, in which the mouse is infected with Salmonella typhimurium, which causes mouse typhoid, and in this mouse uh, there is lethality and monocytic infiltrate in the gut, and this mouse can be, all, can be also used to study uh, persistence and carriage. So many um, of these animal models, uh, um, of these models have been used to investigate uh, um, inflammatory diarrhea and typhoid fever, and all these models have been useful to contribute to our understanding of disease. Uh, so what are the major virulence of mm, uh, Salmonella? Um, so one major thing that distinguishes Salmonella, for example, from its close relative E. coli is the ability to invade uh, the intestinal epithelium. And you can see here that host cell invasion occurs thanks to this virulence factor that is a type 3 secretion system encoded by the Salmonella pathogenicity island 1. This uh, type 3 secretion system delivers effectors and uh, in this way mediates a salmonella uptake by non-phagocytic cells. And uh, SPI1 uh, and its effectors are needed for the, for, for the development of inflammatory diarrhea. So here you can see a calf intestine. So this calf was infected with wild-type salmonella and developed this, infl- this strong inflammation with neutrophil infiltrate. Um, calf instead that is infected with a mutant in this type 3 secretion system and does not develop disease. And this um, uh, type 3 secretion system encoded by SPI1 is not needed to spread beyond the gut. Salmonella encodes for a second uh, type 3 secretion system encoded by the pathogenicity island 2, uh, which also delivers effectors into cells. And uh, it's necessary for salmonella survival inside those cells and for the formation of the salmonella containing uh, vacuole. You can see here salmonella replication inside the macrophages, uh, that is inside this vacuole. And uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, type 3 secretion system encoded by SPI2 also contributed to diarrhea, although to lesser extent than the SPI1 type 3 secretion system. And, uh, as, uh, however, is main, primarily um, involved also in the spread salmon- of salmonella beyond the gut. I'd like to mention also the um, SPV virulence plasmid. Um, this has been uh, widely studied here at UCSD by Don Gani and Josh Feeder, and some of the uh, SPV encoded genes are actually um, uh, effectors of the SPI2. And uh, uh, this uh, virulence plasmid is correlated with salmonella dissemination in humans, so strains that um, have the virulence plasmid are capable to disseminate and cause bacteremia. So the, these two um, type 3 secretion system encoded by SPI1 and SPI2, so these two pathogenicity islands, are really a key for salmonella evolution. And this has been shown uh, many years ago that acquisition of SPI1 was a, a primary factor of differentiation from uh, E. coli to salmonella. And then acquisition of SPI2 uh, was a, a primary factor for salmonella to evolve from the cold-blooded animal like reptiles to mammals. And you can see here, for example, um, the species uh, um, enterica, which is the most prevalent one. And uh, um, this uh, now, with uh, more detailed genomic studies, we can actually we can actually evaluate the common uh, um, ancestor and see uh, which uh, um, uh, how Salmonella bongorai and, for example, Salmonella typhi um, have uh, evolved. And you can see that Salmonella bongorai has a limited number of pathogenicity island and limited metabolomes compared, for example, to Salmonella typhi that has acquired a lot more 
factors to be able to uh, replicate uh, in, the, in the mammals and in the human host. So let's go over now the topics that I'm going to cover. So first, uh, how does non-typhoidal salmonella cause inflammatory diarrhea? So as I said, the salmonella is an invasive pathogen, invades epithelial cells, can replicate in macrophages, and uh, this triggers an inflammatory cascade with production of IL-23 and stimulation of the numerous T cells in the gut to release cytokines like IL-17 and IL-22 and the consequent uh, production of CXC chemokines and neutrophils come in and uh, neutrophils are able to kill salmonella um, in the tissue. Um, however, uh, in, the, uh, in the lumen, neutrophils can secrete also reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, which uh, affects the gut microbiota. And uh, at the same time, the production of antimicrobial peptides by neutrophils and, and epithelial cells results in a nutrient limitation. However, salmonella is able to grow and replicate and acquire nutrients in this environment, which mediates the invasion of a host antimicrobial responses, uh, fecal shedding and transmission. So why do some patients develop bacteremia? So uh, I can give you here the example of uh, a project that, uh, and that I was involved with many years ago in which uh, we investigated uh, the mechanism by which uh, um, HIV uh, infection uh, enabled and promoted salmonella bacteremia. And uh, so we used uh, the simian immunodeficiency virus uh, model in rhesus macaques and we found that um, SIV in rhesus macaques uh, promotes a depletion of Th17 cells. And these... Uh, results uh, in a blunted inflammatory response. Uh, so this response that I show you, this Th17 responses, is blunted in HIV-infected macaques, and this leads to increased bacterial dissemination and also, as shown by others, increased microbiota translocation. So now let's move on to the second group of salmonella, the typhoidal salmonella, and discuss why does typhoidal salmonella not cause inflammatory diarrhea. So this has been puzzling for a long time because a salmonella typhi has the same virulence factors as uh, um, salmonella typhi murium, for example, and cause pathogenicity islands by one and by two, although some effectors are pseudogenes. Um, there is uh, no uh, virulence plasmid, however, which uh, in the non-typhoidal salmonella can promote dissemination in susceptible hosts. There is uh, extensive genome degradation with a loss of function in over 200 pseudogenes in salmonella typhi. And uh, at the same time, though, there is a gain on function and acquisition, for example, of the SPICE 7, which encodes for the VI capsule, and also acquisition of the typhi toxin. So um, first, uh, so when, if we look at the, uh, how salmonella interact with the host immunity, um, we, we found, we and others, we found that the salmonella typhi VI capsule is able to promote evasion of innate immunity. So Salmonella typhimurium for the host looks like this uh, red noisy plane. So it triggers a strong inflammatory response, is able uh, to activate TLR5 and node signaling and complement activation and, and causes this massive inflammation that I showed you a few slides before. However, um, Salmonella typhi uh, by expressing uh, the VI uh, antigen and by shutting down expression of the uh, of SPI1 and flagelling with this regulator TVIA is able to uh, look like a stealth, um, a stealth pathogen and basically fly below the radar and be totally under, and be largely undetected by the immune system. You can study this, for example, in animal models where you can express the VI um, uh, locus in Salmonella typhimurium, and this uh, causes reduced inflammation comparison to uh, what you see with the Salmonella typhimurium wild type. So this is a summary of what I just told you, that Salmonella typhi is able to fly below the radar and the inflammatory response during, uh, during a typhoid fever in the gut is actually blunted. So there is much lower inflammation. We don't know why there is an increased monocytic infiltrate, but we just know that there is really no neutrophil infiltrate and the Salmonella typhi actually disseminates and is able to cause bacteremia. So, but still, how, how does a typhoidal salmonella causes typhoid fever 
Um, and uh, uh, the short answer is that we don't completely understand it. However, there are some insights on important virulence factors that, that might contribute to some characteristic of typhoid fever. Now, one, of these, one of these factors uh, is the typhoid toxin. So, um, Jorge Galan's group many years ago described that uh, Salmonella typhi um, has uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, typhoid uh, toxin uh, and uh, um, composed by a cytolethal distending toxin and PTLA and PTAB, which are homologous to pertussis toxin. This toxin has a peculiarity that is expressed only inside the host cells and it causes cytoplasmic distension and cell cycle arrest. And what also what they show is that animal inoculated with a purified typhoid toxin develop some sign of acute typhoid fever, like stupor and leukopenia. And, uh, and also here at UCSD, uh, the Varki group, in collaboration with the Galan group, uh, found some important features of the typhoid toxin that, in, in that it binds to sialylated glycans. And in particular, it binds to new 5AC in humans. You can see here the, this strong binding. But it doesn't bind, for example, to new 5GC, uh, which is a very similar sugar in chimpanzees which might explain why chimpanzees, chimpanzees can be colonized uh, uh, with uh, high doses of typhi, but they do not develop, uh, they do not develop typhoid uh, disease. Despite you know, this uh, terrific progress, however, we still don't know what is the role of the typhoid toxin in vivo. Uh, in fact, the recent studies in which human volunteers were infected with either Salmonella typhi wild type or a typhoid toxin the leading mutant actually showed that there was no, no difference in the development of the typhoid fever. And uh, in, if anything, uh, the patients infected with the typhoid toxin mutant develop bacteremia for a longer time. So perhaps uh, the toxin plays a role in a more severe disease, which of course cannot be modeled in human volunteers, it's too risky, or uh, in chronic carriage. So future studies are really necessary to determine the role of the, ty of the typhoid toxin in vivo. And, uh, uh, to study also um, Salmonella typhi in vivo, uh, investigators are uh, now using, for example, humanized mice with uh, human uh, stem cells. And uh, for example, in this study by Ferry Fang's group, uh, um, a mutant library of Salmonella typhi was used to see uh, what virulence factors were essential in this model. And it was found that the VI capsular antigen was essential and so was iron acquisition by um, Salmonella and was also, uh, was also essential for, the develop for lethality in this model. And uh, in this model, they didn't find a role for the typhoid toxin, but they, and, and then again, these are mice, uh, although they have a human immune system, so there could be uh, some, uh, some important factors that are not, uh, um, that are not considered in this, in this model. So last but not least, uh, an important question is why are typhoidal salmonella restricted to humans? And we still don't know that. But at least we gain some insights of host restriction of Salmonella typhi by um, beautiful work that was done by my good friend, uh, um, Professor Stefania Spano, um, both as a postdoctoral fellow in, in an independent laboratory. And unfortunately, Stefania uh, passed away last year and she left us uh, uh, too soon. But this is kind of her legacy, so I want to bring uh, her work to your attention. So Stefania basically found that Salmonella typhi is killing in mouse macrophages, and this is dependent of RAB32 and Block3. There is an, an unknown antimicrobial mechanism that is able to control Salmonella typhi replication in mouse macrophages. And Salmonella typhimurium, on the other hand, is able to evade this by secreting two effector proteins, GTGE and SOBD2, that are absent from Salmonella typhi. So this is an important mechanism of host restriction, um, although certainly there is more to know and to learn about why typhi is restricted to humans. So with that, I would like uh, to uh, thank you for your attention and I would like to thank all the Salmonella researchers all over the world who have uh, inspired this presentation and have contributed with their work uh, to uh, an understanding of this uh, important and uh, challenging human pathogen. I also like to acknowledge my funding sources. Uh, thank you very much. 